Hey, Collateral Cinema listeners, Chazzle Dazzle here from the Trial by Air Variety Show podcast, just taking a few seconds to invite you guys over to what we do. Much like Collateral Cinema, we are a grassroots podcast. We invite bands from all over the world to come in, and we dig deep into their souls and find really cool stories to tell you, and there's tons of music every week, so subscribe to us wherever you subscribe to your podcast. We look forward to having you. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Ortegon. I'm Ashley Chancellor. This is Collateral Cinema. Welcome to Collateral Cinema, the only movie podcast that matters, where we focus on good movies, bad movies, and everything else in between in the world of cinema. We're podcasting straight from somewhere in South Texas, and yes, my friends, we are a 420-friendly podcast. So whatever you have, be it dabs, be it blunts, be it bongs, be it joints, smoke it if you've got it. And welcome back to the main episode of Collateral Cinema. The main show, I should say. Right, guys? That's uh, the director's cut. Yep, outside of Collateral Cinema, director's cut, of course. Yeah, our regular numbered episodes. Yeah, we were actually back to doing this again. And we're doing this quarantine style, of course. Ash, you're in San Antonio right now, right? Yeah, I'm FaceTiming in. Um, I know the audio quality is going to be a little different, but bear with us, guys. We're just trying to do the responsible thing. and um, Yeah, definitely. Definitely the responsible thing. Continue to provide content for you, you know, while being safe. Always, you know? Yeah, I mean, we, we've got to be responsible. It's best to stay home. I mean, I'm sheltering at home as well. So is Robert. Yeah. You know, face it, guys. We're we're essential. Yeah, we're all essential right. workers, pretty much. Well, we're maybe essential not, workers. Maybe not Robert. No, as <laughs> podcasters. <laughs> God damn it! So anyway, the movie that we are focusing on today is Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. Now, what did you guys think when you first saw this movie? Oh man, it's like you don't want to like the movie, but it's a masterpiece. Uh, I know it's it's very uncomfortable to watch actually, but it's it so depressing. Necessary. No, and and Walking Phoenix's portrayal of the Joker, I mean, of just mental illness, you know, is profound. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I thought that his performance was phenomenal. Honestly, I mean, it, it's it's right. one of the better representations of the Joker that I've seen. Right, Robert? Yeah, so far. And. I wanted to go ahead and talk about the Joker as a character himself. I mean, he doesn't really start off with much of an origin at all in the comics or anything, right? He, he doesn't even have a defined origins. He, isn't there that quote where he's like, you know, if you're going to have an origin story, why not multiple choice? Exactly. That that comes from uh, the Killing Joke, right? That that Was, was it the, the Killing Joke? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think, so. I think it was from that one. Yeah. And... I really like that version of the Joker. That was very interesting. But, I mean, sometimes even just the earlier, you know, just more straightforward representations of him was pretty awesome, I thought. Even back from uh, when he first started. I don't remember when he first appeared in comics. Uh, would, you, would you happen to know, Ash? Uh, I think pretty early. It's like the yeah. best All, uh, Batman newspaper comics, right? I was going to say, but, you know, I um, I appreciate every version of the Joker, essentially. I mean, there's Jared Leto. That's the elephant in the room. The only one that people don't think is phenomenal. And, you know, I made a case for him in their Suicide Squad episode. You can go watch that. I think it's an interesting take on the character, at least. And I'm glad that it's been added to the repertoire. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's a little different, but, I mean... I, I, I don't find it to be a very serious portrayal for some reason. I, I, I think he just really overdid it way he, too much. But I mean, isn't that a thing though? Like every actor that plays the Joker, like has to go through some like fucked up shit. I mean, except for Michael Keaton. I mean, he, he also did, I'm sorry, 
I'm thinking of Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I said Michael Keaton. I meant Jack Nicholson because he's already crazy. He was in The Shining. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How do you feel the Joker's character okay. has really translated into film? I mean, there's a lot of variations to the Joker, even some on TV. I mean, starting with Cesar Romero, right? Yeah, the old Batman TV show. Right? Yeah. What do you think, Robert? What's your favorite uh, portrayal of the Joker? You know, the the master who did that was uh, Jerry Leto, man. And he came with the straight from the comics, you know, his own thing. So you actually like Jared Leto's uh, portrayal? Oh, not Jared Leto. I said Cesar Romero. Sorry about Cesar that. Romero. <laughs> <laughs> Jared Leto. We're all fucking ass backwards on this podcast. I know. What the hell, man? I can barely Seriously. hear it. Let's cut it, get it out. I like, think we're celebrating 420 month a little too hard. 420? Maybe a little too hard. <laughs> started drinking yeah. earlier. Yeah, I did. I still started day drinking. Like, I'm like, we're out of, of routine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I'm pretty much in the same bailiwick as well. You know? Didn't that make the Joker movie more meaningful, though? Because Gotham was kind of going to shit. And when I was watching it, I was kind of thinking about how things are not quite that bad, but kind of turning to shit. You know what yeah, I mean? Oh, yeah, this is definitely a movie for this time. I mean, it's, it's funny program. that it came out last year, you know? By the way, the Joker debuted in Batman number one. That was back in 1940. 1940. God damn. Yeah. yeah, and he was really a lot more straightforward of a portrayal. I mean, he was just more of a literal jester, but a criminal. And yeah. I mean, Cesar Romero's portrayal was very over the top. It was very campy. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's definitely one of the classic portrayals. But, of course, we got to talk about Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson, you know? yeah. Ash, what right. do you think about his portrayal? Well, that's what I was saying. I mean, he's already got that crazy. He's the only actor that didn't have to go through hell to be the Joker. And that's because, like, you can tell the limits he was pushed in, like, as, what's his face, from The Shining? From The Shining? Uh, Jack Nicholson. No, I know the actor's name. Fucking the character's name. Jack something. Oh, Jack Torrance. He, he always plays. Jack the Torrance. <laughs> it was Jack Torrance. Yeah, that's what yeah. That's it was, yeah. Dude, so, yeah, you get a little bit of that portrayal. To be honest, though, I haven't seen the full Tim Burton's Batman. Robert and I, we were watching it the other day, not not too long ago. but <laughs> Yeah, th that's a great movie. I, I like it. Great. But I, I got to say my favorite portrayal is probably, I mean, it's it, it's really a toss-up between Heath Ledger and Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal is absolutely stunning, I think. But There's so many different reason. Yeah, it's not comic accurate in any sense of the term, and yet it's good. Definitely, Robert. What do you think about Joaquin Phoenix's Joker? I, th I think you know he kind of came into his own with the Joker, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's it's definitely I mean, a there's more. There's so many. There's so many takes on every scene that he did. I mean, he did it more than like ten times, like it, different ways. You know? Yeah, it, it's far more nuanced <clears throat> because you know this is a movie that unlike. The Dark Knight, you know, the Joker is only in so much of that movie. Yeah. This is a full-fledged two-and-a-half-hour or under two-and-a-half-hour-long movie that just focuses on this Drange. character's development, yeah. you know? And even then, it's yeah. still not a accurate origin story for him at all. No, and the fact that Joker's a completely different character. I mean, this Joker is a little slow. The the a Joker, you know, in the comics is you know the megalomaniac mastermind. But I think there's kind of an explanation for that that's been provided, and that's that maybe this isn't the actual Joker, but the inspiration that started the movement. Yeah, I've kind of like heard what they did with the Gotham series. Yeah, I've heard that theory before, and I think that is very pertinent to this story. I mean. Really, you can take any kind of approach to what the Joker's origin actually is. I mean, going back to the killing night or the killing joke thing, you know, it's multiple choice. That's how the Joker wants it to be. Yeah, the um, the portrayal here, it's just interesting because it's a completely accurate portrayal of mental illness. And you feel that and you know that. And you don't there's a point where you don't know whether to sympathize or empathize with him or not. You know, yeah, yeah, you can't sympathize with him. You're not even sure you should sympathize, and yet you can't help but, but sympathize. I guess. I think that it's best at least to empathize with the character and what actually led Arthur Fleck into becoming the Joker here. 
I mean, it's a lot of extenuating yeah. circumstances, but then again, remember, this is an unreliable narrator we're talking about here, you know? That's true. And I like that they have the the character, his girlfriend, who's not actually his girlfriend, but she was like, he, she's just a hallucination in there. You can tell because she just pops it out of nowhere. No explanation. It makes no sense. So I kind of knew the whole time she was fake, but the movie portrays her so real that you almost lose sight of that. And that's the Joker's mind. Like he believes it. And what's interesting about that is how that translates into his later relationship with Harley Quinn. I mean, if if you want to include her in this timeline, I don't know if it would if it, if it would work right. I mean, but I, I'm I'm willing to see whatever they're going to do with Joker in the future. Like, it, I know that they are planning a sequel, right? They should be. I, I don't think that they really should make it. Honestly, this I think movie they should kind of stands on its own. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. definitely a standalone movie, like, and like Taxi Driver. Yeah, exactly. And, and honestly, we're not even sure if what we're seeing is the full story. It's probably just all a figment of Arthur Fleck's imagination. Exactly. And, and if you if you make a sequel, you'll lose sight of that. You lose that that mystery and the ambiguity. You know. Exactly. But I mean, the character has gone many, many, many different uh, paths. I guess you could say. Like personally. I really, really like Heath Ledger's take on the character. I mean, it's almost the definitive take on the Joker before this movie came out. Like, no, honestly, yeah. It, it has that right balance of comic accurate and realistic, you know, like Walking Phoenixes. Heath Ledger, that's why it stands up. And, and both portrayals, I can appreciate for different reasons. Yeah, certainly. Robert, what do you think about Heath Ledger's portrayal? Oh, I think it was more darker take on Jack Nicholson's Joker, you know? That's where you think it was coming from? More yeah, or less? I think so. Just more darker, more darker Batman, you know? It's not, well, Tim Burton was really that dark, right? Tim Burton was dark as fuck. It, it was dark. About? Coming out of the TV show and what the TV show was. Yeah. Well, I mean, I especially, dark, yeah. especially Batman Returns. I yeah. mean,. That was such a fucked up movie when you actually watch it. Yeah. I mean, I don't even really think uh, the Penguin is really that much of a villain in that movie, honestly. Danny DeVito. He, he's more of a, just a pawn. Despicable B it's, character. It's been a while since I've seen Batman Returns. True. I remember the, the, the Penguin was like was disabled, and that was actually a, a departure from the comics that made its way into the comics later. But yeah, I, I really did always enjoy the the Heath Ledger portrayal. Heath I think Ledger. just because of yeah how realistic it, it was, both in terms of comic accuracy and true to life accuracy, life accuracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really like the setting of Gotham at that point in time. You know, th this is supposed to be around 1980, 1981. And it even has echoes of certain types of social strife that occurred in like New York around that yeah. time. There was the, a big sanitation worker strike and yeah. that's pretty much the backdrop of this movie is just all this trash collecting all over the place because the sanitation workers are on strike. I mean, that, that really just lays down the tone like right away. Like old New York Nasty. I mean, the first thing that you actually hear about is that garbage worker strike. Yeah, it it like I said before, it's really uh, a, a different perspective seeing that during the epidemic or like just the pandemic that we're having now. I think there's certain points where certain parts of Gotham are actually declared uh, public health disaster zones. If I if I yeah. remember correctly, and then there's those super rats that come out of nowhere. It's like super rats. I kept mentioning the super rats. Super Shredder rat. Yeah, they really tried to hype up those super rats, but we never saw a fucking super rat, did we? <laughs> I'm very disappointed in that. There should have been like rats the size of small dogs running around. Yeah, at least chihuahua uh, size. Did you get? Yeah, chihuahua sized like rats. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Did you guys like that opening like? opening credits sequence where it was kind of like uh, the title of the yeah, movie came it, on as like fifties. Yeah. It was an uh, old school eighties era Warner brothers logo. Yeah. That was really cool. I thought that was a good yeah. little callback amongst all kinds of callbacks in this movie. Like, I mean, there's lots of Easter eggs, but we'll get into that here in a little bit. 
Robert, what do you think about Todd Phillips as a director in this movie? I mean, what what did you see here? I think he was trying to capture the essence of the character, you know, just going deep. Yeah, it's very much a character Kinda study. Kind of like Scorsese, what he did with Travis Bickle. And I think it was a lot of take on Nicholas reference, too. You think there was some uh, Nicholas winding refin yeah. influence there? Like- especially with the neon lighting. You know. Yeah, plus you can make some arguments about this having a little bit of a parallel with Drive. Yeah, Drive, somewhat. Only God Forgives, you know. Except I would say that Drive has a more heroic bent to it. Yeah. That, that, that's actually a person who's really, really fucked up and in a fucked up kind of situation trying to become a good person. Mm. This is the other way around. Oh, yeah. Like he has at yeah. least the outer veneer of a good person but he, over time he just completely just becomes really dark and twisted and he, he becomes a shell of his former self oh yeah i mean at one point he doesn't even have an identity you know unknown person which, which is yeah. which is in line with the storyline of the joker especially if you remember the dark knight but yeah i thought that todd phillips was actually really impressive as a yeah. director in this movie. Pretty I mean, this is the same guy that did the Hangover movies, which I guess you can see flourishes of that uh, directorial style coming out there really? a little bit. The Hangover. Yeah, huh. yeah, he did the Hangover movies. That's, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, you remember that, that's that? That's a total, total yeah. shift, though. Did yeah. he do I mean, all three of them? I think he, he did, did all three of them. He definitely did the first one, and that's the best one, oh, obviously. Original. The original is awesome in so many ways. Las Vegas. And I, I can kind of see some of the storytelling flourishes that he used in Joker in that movie. I mean, I, I can kind of see that he definitely has a an eye for cinema. Like, especially when it comes to the underlying homage to uh, Martin Scorsese in this movie. Oh, yeah. Because there's two Scorsese movies that are prevalently referenced throughout this movie and that's mm-hmm. Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy. King of Comedy. And they're both very similar movies in their own right, you know. It's just King of Comedy is arguably a little less violent, you know. I haven't seen that. Damn it. Well, it's it's pretty much like Taxi Driver but he's a comedian on the bottom. Like that really influenced this movie deeply. Yeah. Ash, what do you think about Todd Phillips as a director? I mean, have you had a whole lot of experience with his work? I can't say I know the name. I'm, I'm not. That doesn't mean I haven't watched a movie he's directed. But well, you've seen The Hangover, right? Oh, yeah. I have not seen The Hangover. Oh, actually. I what? The Hangover. How could you not see The Hangover, what? dude? What the? What? I don't know. I think it. Came, I think it came out during a time that it wasn't like appropriate for me to watch or something. Oh, I see. Yeah, you were too young to watch R-rated movies, huh? God damn. I it. don't know. I think my parents just didn't want me to. Well, you should totally watch that movie. Honestly, it's a very oh, clever cool. comedy. What about Hot Tub Time Machine? Hot Tub Time Machine. That's kind of uh, the same. A little, a little bit. It's kind of along the same uh, line as yeah. the Hangover. Hangover. I would say. Yeah. I don't know, dude. I was 14 when The Hangover came out. Maybe maybe I should have just been a rebel. Yeah, you should have. I mean, if I was 14 <laughs> at that time, I would have seen The Hangover. Yeah. <laughs> dude, when I was 14, I was watching horror movies like The Relic and fucking Halloween and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Right, right, Robert? You, you know, Classic. speaking of my parents, um, my parents don't like this movie. And they're the really? only people I know that don't like it. And I guess their one hang-up they keep saying is that the Joker is the thing I said earlier, you know, that he's he's slower and he's he's not like a, intelligent enough to be a criminal mastermind, but it's kind of like they're missing the point. This wasn't a movie trying to tell the comic version of the Joker. It was like, I, I think they literally explained this as putting the Joker in the walking Phoenix world or something like that. Yeah. 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 Exactly. The way they put it, you know, um, putting him into the role. And I, I really think that doesn't shouldn't be overlooked the value that this film has in portraying, you know, no matter how you feel about it, in portraying, you have to admit. Well, I mean, the thing that your parents would probably need to know is that this may not even be the real story yeah. here when it comes to right. Joker and his origins. You know, right. it's always changing with him. Walking Phoenix thinks that he's the the, the actual Joker, but uh, Todd Phillips said he was open to the interpretation that you know it could just be the you know kind of the proto the origin, Joker, but not. 
Yeah. Proto Joker, exactly. So, which is kind of in line with the way the comics handles it, right? There's multiple origin stories. There really is. Yeah. Hmm. Even in video games and on the animated series, yeah. I think that he had some yeah. different origins. Although I don't remember if they went into his origin story during the, the animated series. Do you, Robert? Yeah, I think he got injections. The old Batman animated series, like yeah, 1993. Yeah, the original from the 90s. Yeah, I remember the story, like watching Batman Beyond, uh, Rise of the Joker or something. See, even that's a different interpretation of the Joker. You know, Dude, Mark Hamill has got to be be maybe hands down the best portrayal actually oh, oh yeah. definitely oh, yeah. mark hamill yeah how could how could we even forget him i mean he did such a great job in the arkham games yeah yeah, yeah. in particular too and, you know obviously in addition to the dc animated universe which i heard is coming to an end is it really shit god damn that that's sad that's like their best cinematic universe period Honestly. Yeah, they're doing like their last movie or something. Apparently, I, I saw wow. it on Facebook. Maybe it's, I don't even. Maybe it's not true. I don't know. You know, you know what they say about internet news. I don't know. That's such a cash cow for them that it's like. I mean, you would think that they would just do an MCU and just you know go into a different phase of, of the universe. You know, it, it definitely deserves to exist more than the, the DC EU. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I would argue the same. Honestly. Especially Justice League. Ooh. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. Justice League. Ooh. Ugly. Is DCEU movie. even a thing anymore? Because originally I thought the Batman with you, Robert Pattinson, Matt Reeves movie was going to be the, kind of a younger Ben Affleck. But apparently that's not the case because, well, they cast a, 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 they're casting a black Commissioner Gordon, I think. Oh, is that so? Which would directly contradict. They better, they better cast Charles S. Dutton in that role. I can totally see him as Commissioner Gordon. He'd just be like, you know, you done fucked up, right? <laughs> you know, you fucked up, right? You fucked up, right? <laughs> so, anyway, I think that it's obviously now going to take place in a completely separate universe, and maybe it's the better for that. Maybe we just bury the DCEU, somehow salvage Shazam and Aquaman. Yeah. Wasn't there some speculation that this particular Joker might be the Joker that might be in the new Batman movie? Do we know that to I be think fact? It's Robert not Patterson. Fact. I think some some fans are are trying to connect the dots and say, but I don't. I'm not sure. Well, we don't know yet if, if that tone is going to match, but that would be badass. From what I'm looking from some of the production materials coming out now, it's going to be a pretty dark and gritty Batman movie. Yeah, like even more so than the, the Zack Snyder movies. So or the Christopher Nolan films or the Nolan films even. Yeah, it, it's going to yeah. be even darker than that probably. But is it as dark as and gritty as Joker? Because that's going to be hard to top. It really is. But, I mean, th that's why this works so much as a standalone movie. It does. I, I don't necessarily think it needs to be in another universe. But maybe another movie could benefit from being the same universe as it. <laughs> maybe so. I, I, I don't know. But I don't know. I'm, I kind of feel when you say, you know, Joker should be left alone. Because if we make a sequel, it's almost like... It's honestly a situation, I don't usually say this, but it's honestly a situation which could ruin the first movie. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It really could. It, it can ruin a lot of the actual meaning behind it. Spider-Man 3 ruins the Raimi trilogy for me. <laughs> hey, yeah, that, that's a perfect that example. Is, so I have to watch one and two together and pretend that three doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird. And then watch three when I'm in a different mood, like when I'm in like a meme mood. Oh, it's yeah, separate. Definitely. It exists. It's a separate universe. Okay, I'm trying to... <laughs> <laughs> oh god damn it uh robert what are your thoughts on the cinematography in this movie i mean this has a very unique look to it as far as portraying the character of the joker right oh yeah like it definitely evokes that old new york feel that martin scorsese exactly. captured in yeah. uh, taxi driver taxi driver yeah. like it has that in spades, right? Old New York style, just old and dirty. Just All gritty and dirty. Looking and like a sewer, you know what I mean? Damn. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I really liked uh, how a lot of the shots kind of paralleled each other a little bit. Like, especially like that opening where Joaquin Phoenix was uh, beaten down by that group of kids yeah. after they stole his sign. And then it, it kind of paralleled that near the end whenever Bruce is standing there in the alleyway and his parents have just been killed and everything. And it kind of has that same uh, panning out 
uh, quality to it. Yeah. Like, th- I thought that that was really that interesting. That was cool. And also the way that color was used in this movie. Like, for instance, how what Arthur Fleck is wearing most of the time is kind of indicative of his weird desire to go back to Arkham Asylum. Because... Like re- remember when he was in, he was at Arkham trying to get those uh, records from his mom. His jacket was the same. Yeah. His jacket walls. and everything. Yeah, it, yeah, it was pretty much the same color as all of the hallways, right? Mm. And yeah, that's interesting. And also, there was a parallel in his actual Joker costume to the colors on the curtains on the Murray Franklin show. That that, that kind of showed, you know, how he had this dream to become this great. Uh, stand-up comedian and everything but it all just fell apart and it fell apart because of murray franklin yes, you know did. airing I, that i clip thought his jokes it. were pretty funny actually okay they were pretty funny it's like knock knock who's there the policeman it's your son he was he's dead he got hit by a drunk driver <laughs> i'm paraphrasing yeah. that of course yeah. <laughs> i guess that's funny i mean you can't joke about that but you know, you know what's great is that uh, Penny Fleck. She she straight up says to uh, to Arthur, "Is like, what makes you think that you could do this? Shouldn't you be funny?" <laughs> straight straight up calls him out for not being funny. Dude, it's that like, would be my mom. It's like, yeah, exactly right. Oh my god, <laughs> Ash, you're not going to turn into Arthur Fleck, are you? Are you already Arthur no, Fleck? Not that bad. No, I'm not. So I think I'm a little Arthur Fleck every now and again. How about you, Robert? Yeah, try to hide it. Right? Try to hide Wait it from everybody, you know. Wait a second. Are, we being fucking, are you being like a fucking neckbeard now? Oh, oh, I don't know. Maybe I, I am. With, I, I, identify I think that, with Rick Sanchez, and I identify with, with Joaquin Phoenix's Arthur Fleck. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, We need man. to take our medicine, bull. Yes, we need to take our medicine. It's like it's like those stupid fucking Facebook posts that are like, it says like, uh, w- when you're a child, you idolize Batman. When you're an adult, the Joker makes more sense. No, he doesn't. He's a psychopath. <laughs> if that makes sense to you. Yeah, the Joker was always meant to be a psychopath. Mm. Yeah. But Deranged. then again, this movie does a good job, though, of portraying some of those mental illness aspects, you know, depression, anxiety that, that we feel in everyday life. Well, it's it's very it subtle. All of those together. My polar schizophrenic. Yeah. It's very subtle when you really look at Phoenix's performance. Like, there's actual moments where he absolutely quits breathing. He holds his breath. He doesn't take a breath, and that's kind of showing him kind of swell up in anger. You know that that's his tell whenever he's really angry and he's just like, "Fuck!" You know, this isn't going my way. Like that, that, that's kind of how I saw that. You know? Yeah. It's very subtle. All the situations you feel like are situations you could find yourself in. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Yeah. As a normal person. Definitely. It's, it's everyday a, person. He's a very relatable it's, character, uh, believe it or not. Because, I mean, it, we, we it, all have it, our at own. at the same time, unrelatable, you know, in the same token. But we, we all relate to him in some, in some way. But the whole is something that's aliens, is something that's new. Yeah. Now, Ash, what do you think about the actual screenplay of this movie? I mean, I, I think oh, it's that well written for sure. It's well written. It's really quotable in some ways. I think. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a few memes, you know, like the you wouldn't get it. I was just waiting for that scene to happen, like, and I knew as yeah, soon the, as, the, as soon as they were there. No, you you wouldn't get it. It's like yeah, that's total meme material right there. I saw the meme before the movie, so. <laughs> And also, another thing that's become a meme for this movie is his confrontation with Thomas Wayne in the bathroom. There's that moment, it's like, you think this is funny? And he's just funny. like, yeah, and then he just punches, just punches him. It's like, <laughs> fuck yeah, man. Fuck yeah. I, have, I had fun with that part. Because, you know, I, I'm just like, yeah, totally. Fuck the rich, man. I mean, do we really need them? Nah. I mean... Honestly. Uh, to get yeah. richer? To get it richer? No. We yeah, I, I totally get the sentiments behind the clown protesters. And that had a lot of parallels in real life. You know, especially if you go back to like Occupy Wall Street and all that. And like Anonymous, the online hacktivist collective. I mean, it, ha- it has some parallels there, which was interesting. Yeah, it does. It does. People can relate to that because they, they see it. Even if they're not a part of something like that, you know, it's, it's ingrained in our culture. Oh, definitely. 
I mean, especially here and now, I mean, we're about to hit a recession, if not a, a straight up depression. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, that, uh, that makes the screenplay here so much more pertinent, like especially setting up all the different types of social strife that's going on in Gotham at that time. Can you please stop bothering my kid? Sorry. Arthur, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> this is the last time we'll be meeting. You don't listen, do you? You just ask the same questions every week. How's your job? Are you having any negative thoughts? All I have are negative thoughts. And finally, in a world where everyone thinks they could do my job, check out this guy. When I was a little boy and told people I was going to be a comedian, everyone laughed at me. Well, no one's laughing now. You can say that again, pal. Isn't it? For my whole life, I didn't know if I even really existed. But I do. And people are starting to notice. You think this is funny? <laughs> is this a joke to you? <laughs> Murray, one small thing. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker? Send in the clouds. Like the sanitation workers strike the sentiments against the rich and everything like Thomas Wayne going on TV and calling people like clowns and everything. I mean, that, yeah. that's kind of going against uh, character type for Thomas Wayne in these origin stories. Usually, usually he's seen as kind of like a humanitarian more or less. He is, but this isn't the first time I've seen him in a negative portrayal. There's memes underneath, you know, the, there was the, the Batman telltale game. Yeah. Did the same thing with the Bruce Wayne, or I mean with the Thomas Wayne character, you know, with him kind of being a little underhanded and, you know, maybe not a good guy after all. Yeah, definitely. And what do you think? Do you think that he actually had an affair with Penny Fleck? I think so. I think, yeah. You don't think so? I think he's trying to hide it. No, she hallucinated it just like he hallucinated Zazie Beetz' character. That's true. It could oh, very well be the same thing. You're right. You're right. You're right. I mean, I, th I thought the parallel was obvious there. Yeah. They, I think they pretty much proved it to you. That, you know, mm. that it wasn't real. Yeah, no, it, it's proved invariably that Zazie beats his character is not actually with him yeah, during the his whole time. Oh, for sure. I was talking about uh, Thomas Wayne. And yeah, with Thomas Black, Wayne. But and, but yeah, I, I get that. When he confronts him in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah it's like that, that actually makes too, too much sense, honestly. Mm. <laughs> but I mean, I thought that a really, really crazy scene in this movie was when he actually reads his mother's medical records and finds out what happened to him. I mean, yeah. that that's the point of no return for Arthur Fleck. That, that's what, it's like a catharsis for him. He's, he's actually finally like happy. Yeah. In a sense, or, or purposed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's where everything changes for him. He's, he's, he's finally putting on a happy face. He's finally living up to his nickname. And you can see he walks onto the Murray Franklin show confident, you know, with full on confidence. He, he dances down on. those stairs with full confidence. That's kind of the point of the stairs. You know, like in the beginning of the movie, he's just literally trudging and limping along up those stairs, like just struggling to get to the top, mm. basically struggling to, 
maintain sanity, to maintain his well, everyday life, his yeah. uh, everyday life, his socioeconomic yeah. status. You know, yeah, and that's what that means. And when he turns into the Joker, he's dancing down that shit like it's nothing. Embracing it, right? he's embracing it. He's wow. free. He he's completely gone by that point, and he's dancing down those stairs like they're nothing. At that point, what did you think about this take on you know the Joker's laugh or the you know the idea of the permanent smile? You know <laughs> this concept with him having an actual condition that yeah. makes him which laugh is, involuntarily, which is a real thing. I mean, yeah. especially yeah, if you have some type of head trauma, it's like that that can actually happen. I think that there's a condition where the inverse can happen. And you could just start crying for no reason as well. It's just involuntary. But Dang, so his mom fucked him up. His mom and her boyfriend fucked yeah, him up bad. Beat the shit out of him. Yeah, tied him up yeah. to a radiator, starved him, and beat the shit out of him. I mean, there's there's no other way to sugarcoat that, honestly. Yeah. It's it's straight up abuse. And ultimately, when he finds out that he has no real identity, it's like I feel that liberation on him immediately, right then mm. and there. Like, like, especially when they're flashing back to uh, Penny Fleck when she was younger and she was originally admitted into Arkham, and he's just standing mm -hmm. in the corner watching it while in real life he's just laughing. But, I mean, I, I, I honestly think that this is probably the first time we see real sincere laughter from him other than when he sees his clip on the Murray Franklin show. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he's actually sincerely laughing because he's just like, fucking A, I'm free. I can be done with this. Yeah, it's interesting because the laugh, you know, to the audience, it's almost uncertain, you know, whether it's a free, you know, his condition or whether it's a sincere laugh. But underneath it all, I think, you know, based on the actions that follow. Yeah, a sincere I, laugh. I think it goes back to uh, Phoenix's performance. He has at least three or four distinctive laughs throughout the movie. And you can... You can pretty much tell when he's being sincere mm. and he's laughing sincerely. Yeah. When it's genuine or when it's fake. And usually yeah. it's it's either when he finally sees his video on the Murray Franklin show mm. or it's whenever he actually engages in some type of antisocial behavior or violent action. I mean, he just celebrates it. Like when those two cops are being beat up by the crowd on the subway train and he does that little jig real quick. Yeah. And, uh, kind yeah. of a little victory dance. I mean, he, he's victorious in that moment. The, the dancing is his liberation. I noticed that throughout the film. Yeah, and it has this you know? almost Tai Chi quality to it early on, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's what it looked yeah. like. Yeah, it looked a lot like Tai Chi or ballet in a way, a almost kind of like a very slow, meditative kind of martial art type of movement. You know? Yeah, and you could tell that there was this relief from him. Yeah, that that scene after he shot the Wall Street Bros, he was supposed to play that a lot differently. Like he was supposed to hide the gun and then start frantically washing the grease paint off of his face. But Ooh. instead, that was Joaquin Phoenix that got with Todd Phillips and made the call to try something a little different there, a little more outside the box. And that's where he came up with that dancing quality to his performance like it's, it's because he kind of he kind of saw like a musical quality to arthur fleck and the joker character in general so i mean i, yeah. I think he said something like he wanted to get the music out of the joker that so, makes sense i can really see that yeah and that also kind of makes sense when you consider the soundtrack here I actually really like the soundtrack to this movie, both the original score and the song choices that they made here. It's night and day when you compare it to Suicide Squad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Suicide yeah, no, Squad... the soundtrack it, was great. Say that again? The soundtrack was great. It really was. Like, especially the use of something like Send in the Clowns or whatnot. Send in the Clowns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really cool. I, I like... I like that. And we have Robert De Niro as a supporting actor in this movie as Murray Franklin, which is interesting because he was in both Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy. Right, Robert? Oh, yeah. Both yeah. takes on Joker. Yeah, both of which influenced Joker. Probably the third movie that influenced this was a Charlie Chaplin movie. I don't yeah. know which one it was. But yeah, early Charlie Chaplin was an influence on this movie as well. Ash, what did you think of Robert De Niro's portrayal of Murray Franklin? He's an interesting character because he seems like a decent guy at first. And then whenever he, you know, mocks 
Arthur on television, you're like, well, man, I mean, that's really shitty. But then he treats him with respect on the show. Yeah. You know, so I feel like there's this duality in the character. Well, it goes back to, you know, Murray Franklin being a performer first. That's true. So, like, the real him is maybe a half decent guy, but the performer, you know, gives the people what they want. Exactly. And that's why he picked Arthur Fleck like he did. So he can make fun of him. Yeah, so he can make fun of him as a performer. But, you know, behind the scenes, he's still very affable with Arthur. He comes in and he introduces himself and he, he even skips formalities with him. It's like that, mm-hmm. that's a huge level of respect right there. And it's like it, it's kind of sad that he couldn't afford uh, Arthur that respect on camera, on camera yeah. you know, on camera. But Arthur counted on that. I mean, he came in there with a plan. He did. Yeah. But his plan didn't exactly go the way that he envisioned it, though. He was originally going to kill I, himself. That's true, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hell, but even, yeah, that's right. There, there's even that moment in the green room where he it looks like he's going to go ahead and just blow his brains out right there. But, you know, he doesn't go through it with it then. I, I like that his message wasn't even political. Like he wasn't he said that like this is not a political statement. Like I don't care about this situation. But and yet he still understood the underlying principles and, and was able to rally people to a common cause. Yeah, it's because he was speaking from such an individual perspective. It was pretty much all about him. That's what that rant was about. And then then that final joke that he tells Murray before he shoots him, you know, so what do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with a society that treats him like he's nothing? You get what you fucking deserve or something to that effect. We're going to watch that right now. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing that very, very seriously. But, Ash, I mean, what, what did you think about that particular scene? Oh, I mean, it's really like the crux of the movie because, I mean, quite literally, he takes the name of Joker then. And a name I might add that he took from Murray. From Murray Franklin. Yeah. Because he, he called him Joker. a Joker. Yeah. So he said, he yeah, introduced exactly. me as Joker. And I thought that was so poignant. And honestly, there's just so much clarity in that scene. Just... He speaks his heart out, and it, it's true. It's so true. I see it as the penultimate confrontation between Arthur Fleck as Joker and society as a whole. Yeah. It's that final sociocultural clash and socioeconomic clash that finally just comes to a head in that moment. Like Everything just built up to him just exploding like that on the Murray Franklin show. Yeah, it's all a build up to that. Yeah. And, and the crazy thing is, is that there are some real life parallels there because it may not have been a late night talk show, but there was an incident that happened in the 70s where a TV reporter by the name of Christine Chubbuck actually killed herself live on camera. Jesus Christ. Yeah, during a morning news show. She was a local reporter and she was uh, apparently just kind of disillusioned with her place in the news organization so she brought a gun on screen she said something to the effect of like and now for your daily dose of blood and guts here's a little something for you and she just shoots herself in the head so there there are parallels to that in this scene kind of especially with what he was originally aiming to do on the murray franklin show Yeah, I almost forgot that he was planning on killing himself there. And so, you know, just in the moment, he makes the decision to shoot Murray instead and start this revolution. It's absolutely an impulsive move. I mean, it's it's not what he intended at all. And he unwittingly leads the revolution, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Gotham is set aflame after that. Like, it's actually remarkable. But speaking of all the riots and uh, all of the controversy of this movie, there was a lot of people that were coming out against this movie saying that it might actually inspire people with, you know, certain mental predispositions to act out violently or something, which I always thought was ignorant as fuck. Right, guys? We would say that. Yeah, I, I would say it's the opposite because, in a way, it allows you to juxtapose yourself with the extreme and so in a sense it kind of gives you a sense of security you know yeah yeah i feel like this movie but at the same time i mean you should be careful i think it does deserve a trigger warning when it comes to like if you have some kind of mental disability 
this movie might not be for you. Um, but it at the might, same time, it does not it does not aim to be disrespectful. It's just it's reality. And you can't deny reality. Yeah, there's definitely some moments there that could potentially trigger some people with certain conditions i think especially when it comes to depression and anxiety and everything and maybe even abuse mm. i mean they don't sh they don't really show any outright like child abuse or anything but his backstory with his adoptive mother is pretty grim i mean it's, it's yeah, very grim for sure yeah i mean this movie beats you down dude yeah but i mean i think that a lot of that controversy was really unfounded I mean, it's it's going back to that whole, you know, violent movies and violent video games cause people to act out in real life yeah. bullshit that we've been hearing all of our lives. Even with, like, you know? the music. No, no, yeah. yeah. Yeah, whether it was heavy metal music or Dungeons and Dragons yeah, exactly. or, or <laughs> video games. It doesn't matter. It's the same bullshit. It's amazing that people still think that way in regards to violence in our society. Well, Grand Theft Auto is going to make me kill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that sort right. of bullshit. That's fucking bullshit. You know what I mean? People that have issues have issues for other reasons. It's mental to think that, you know, oh, it's the movies or it's the video games. Like, people are just fucking violent. In fact, before we had movies, you know, that were violent, we actually had actual violence. Yeah, like like, like uh, the gladiators <laughs> in Roman society. Exactly. And everything. Yeah. That's what I'm getting at. So yeah. people are just fucking violent. Salem witch trials. Exactly. Especially when people are riled up into a hysteric. I mean, that history shows that time and time again. Mm. We see a little hysteria now, you know, today. It's happening now. Um, oh, thankfully, yeah. people are starting to calm down, I think, but still. You know, yeah, yeah people are starting not now. to panic so much in regards to COVID-19. I think that they're starting to take a lot of the guidelines a little more seriously, which good. I you mean, I, I, I went ahead and took them seriously and took time off of work to shelter in place myself. You know? Yeah, I did. So I, you know, I called off because my wife's immunocompromised. So, you know, yeah, I have some my household who's at risk. So we, yeah, we went ahead and we. Yeah. Also, your mom had to sequester herself as well. She's compromised. Yeah. As well, yeah, that's yeah, my mom. And my grandmother, who's elderly, they're kind of quarantining themselves Jeez. up near where you guys are at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, th th that really makes this an interesting watch around this time, though. That's something that I really found remarkable. I'm glad we waited. We were going to do an at the movies episode. And we didn't get around to being able to do it. Yeah. But it, it's so much has to, just such a bigger clarity now. It really you know I mean? does. Yeah. It, it, hell, in many ways, it's almost a mirror of this particular moment in time, honestly. Yeah. Spe especially when it comes to straight isolation, which, needless to say, a lot of people are dealing with right now. Mm. Dealing with yeah. straight up isolation from, you know, going out and doing their usual daily routine. Or so, so we think. <laughs> There's plenty of people hey. still going around business as usual. You Spreading know. the coronavirus. Hey, yeah. man, I don't know about you, but I actually take it as great. I mean, I get to play video games all day for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I still have a child to take care of and responsibilities, household chores. But yeah. you know what yeah. I mean? Like, I get to relax. I don't have to work. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the good in this, and I'm not trying to be yeah. little, but yeah. I think everybody kind of needed a rest. Yeah, you're right. Maybe everybody needed to kind of dial it back a little bit. You Hopefully, know? you know, we can pass some, some good legislation to make sure that we're taken care of so that, you know, you don't have to worry about not having yeah. not being able to work. Yeah. But but that's a whole nother conversation altogether, but also <laughs> still kind of pertinent to this movie because another mm -hmm. underlying uh, sociopolitical theme here are cutting of social services, which happened yeah. around that time mental illness and mental health services were cut drastically Medicine. in the early 80s. Medicine. Yeah, pr pretty much done for. And we had Reagan to thank for that. But there's definitely that parallel in this movie. I mean, Arthur completely loses his ability to get medication. Yeah, you know that uh, Gotham is supposed to be in New Jersey, and I, and I think it's based off Chicago, actually. It's, it's based off Chicago more than anything. I, I see it as straight up Chicago, especially in the Dark Knight trilogy. That's yeah, but, but it's Chicago. located supposedly in, in New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But isn't it supposed to be like the New Jersey to Metropolis's New York City? Isn't that what it's supposed yeah, to be? Uh, yeah. It's supposed to be literally like across the river from them, right? I think so. I, I don't like know. Batman I need to... Superman. Yeah. It's just like yeah. right across the street. 
It's kind of weird that they would actually place the two cities like that, that right? Yeah. It happens with New York and New Jersey. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> In mm. real life. Mm. Yeah, but I, I'm talking about as far as the different universes are concerned, you know? Yeah, like right next uh, to each yeah. other. The, the world of Batman and the world of <laughs> Superman, you know, they're... They're kind of diametric opposites. In Spider Man, you know? New York too. Yeah. Spider Man is Manhattan. Queens. Yeah. Manhattan. Yeah, he comes from Queens, right? Queens. Right, Ash. Yeah, he's from Queens. Captain America's from Brooklyn. From Brooklyn. Queens and Brooklyn. God damn. From Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah, I remember them referencing that in Infinity War and Endgame. Just a kid from Queens. It's like, what's up, Queens? It's like, what's up, Brooklyn? There's this, there's a line in Civil War, but. Yeah, it, it is kind of weird. Uh, uh, Batman and Superman have kind of juxtaposed worlds, but they very much exist in the same universe. So, But I always felt like the most compelling Batman movies are the ones that are kind of isolated, you know, like the Nolan trilogy. It just it, it exists on its own, and it has the realism to it that wouldn't fit in with the DC universe. And the Arkham games kind of have a similar vibe. I haven't played the Arkham games, but I've seen enough of them to know what they were going for there and i really like it you know it's almost like the yeah. twisted metal black approach right <laughs> yeah. you, re you remember, uh, remember that, that game robert twisted metal yeah they took twisted metal and they made it all psycho seven killer bullshit or whatever but yeah and there's definitely lots of themes of income inequality and class struggle in this movie right ash Oh, definitely. I mean, this movie completely quite, and it's not even like metaphorical or allegorical. It's there. Like it's bare, naked, it's raw, exposed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially you know, I was watching go ahead. Uh yeah, especially the anti capitalist and anti rich sentiments in this movie i mean it's always in the background like there's even that scene where uh, where arthur is cuddled up in his mom's bed and there's that one newspaper and it says eat the rich right there on the ground and it's yeah. still featured there prominently that you can clearly see it and did I'll you see that movie i was texting you about the other day the the platform what is it now the platform have you seen that no i have not seen the platform yet no, it's kind of like cube, but it, it's totally an allegory for capitalism. Like it's pretty overt, but it, it's a great metaphor. It's a Sp it's the movie's in Spanish, but it's English dubbed. Excellent. It, you should check that out. I feel like you would like that, Bo. Right on. Well, I feel like this is probably a good enough place to go ahead and start giving our final thoughts on this movie. We'll go ahead and start with Robert. What are your mm -hmm. final thoughts on this movie? You know, watching it today was my first time seeing it, and, you know, it's really great. Uh, are we rating this? If you or, want to, yeah, we can give a rating. Or should we just wait for everybody and then give it a rating? No, go ahead and give it All a right. rating. Uh, it. Five out of five, we'll give it a five. I, I'd say this is definitely a five out of five or ten out of ten material. Ten out of ten. I, I would Easy. definitely say so. How about you, Ash? What are your thoughts on this movie? Uh, yeah, I have to give it a five out of five, and it's weird because it's not the sort of thing that I feel like I would like, but it completely masters what it's attempting to do. Well, if you love Scorsese, uh, she, you're going to love this. So, it, you know, yeah, it, you can't rate it any lower than five out of five because there's no imperfections here. It's, like I said in the beginning, it, it's a movie that's it's almost unbearable to watch, in a sense, because it's just so heart-wrenching, but... At the same time, like you have to watch it. Like you need to see the harsh reality. It helps. It makes you realize the nature of things. I think no matter where you come from or what walk of life, somebody relates to something in here. Definitely. I mean, it, it doesn't even matter if you've even experienced mental illness or not. I yeah. mean, th this is quite possibly one of the better portrayals of that particular side of the human condition that like, I've seen in a like long Norman time. Bates, right? Ooh. Yeah. Norman Bates, uh, for yeah. his time, that was pretty yeah. uh, ahead of its curve. Pretty ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, now it's a little kind of pedestrian. Yeah. I mean, Bates Motel. Yeah. But ba back then, that reading of a character like that, that was pretty much scientifically accurate as far as I know. But my thoughts on this movie, yeah, this is definitely what I look for when I look for awesome cinema in general. I mean, for one, the homage to Scorsese is there, and it's it informs the movie so much. Joaquin Phoenix is a revelation. I mean, he is our most important vegan ever. Vegans. You hear that, Ash? <laughs> our most important vegan. We okay. must protect Joaquin Phoenix at all costs. All you, you costs. Know, <laughs> you know what I uh, pictured Joaquin Phoenix in before watching this movie? All What's I can that? think of is his role in Signs. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Meryl. 
God, yeah, he I've was seen that movie so many times. He was pretty good in that movie, actually. Johnny Cash. Oh, yeah, of course, Johnny Cash. I mean, w- without a doubt. But yeah, man, I mean, I love the cinematography in this movie. Like, the paralleling of scenes is really cool. Mm-hmm. Like, it pretty much uh, bookends the movie with uh, similar shots, just with different characters. Yeah. And honestly, the the script is so fucking solid. I love this movie, honestly. I really enjoyed watching it a second time with Robert. I, I watched it originally by myself, but watching it with Robert and actually kind of exchanging our ideas about the movie, it, it actually kind of heightened the experience a little bit. Yeah, I watched it with my wife and Dakota, yeah. who's gone, missing, absent. Damn it, Dakota. Mm-hmm. He's here, but we just did an episode with Collateral Gaming, and he's, like, all worn out from that. I'm like, yeah. fuck it. I'm ready for more. I podcast all night. But Oh, shit. We just uh, wrapped up recording our episode on uh, God of War. If you follow the Collateral Gaming video game podcast, that should be out shortly after the release of this episode on, on Joker. So stay tuned for that. Just, just throw my little plug in there, all right? Yeah, we might as well get the plug out of the way now. Get the plug out. You can follow Collateral Gaming wherever you listen to Collateral Cinema. Exactly. And Robert, anything else to say, bro? Hmm. Probably going to watch it one more time. Yeah. Anything you want to plug? Uh, no, I'm good. You're good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there might be some things in the works, but we're not going to get into that right now, right? Yeah, due to COVID-19. Yes, due to COVID-19. <laughs> Scheduling issues. Damn it. Oh, yeah, Robert. Are, are you getting? Are you having to delay your... Indie indie film productions. Well, I'm talking to a producer right now. I already sent my film out to an editor, like three editors, and they're gonna get back to me on that. Yeah, so we'll probably have a end product here very soon. (laughs) Yeah, at least a concept or just a final cut, maybe something. Wow, you're pretty you're a pretty big deal, Robert. Yeah, look look at you. You're you're you're, (laughs) you're a big Hollywood filmmaker. (laughs) Pretty big deal, Robert. Uh, Great Hollywood filmmaker. (laughs) We make we make Hollywood movie. Still barely know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's all right. But anyway, yeah, you can find Collateral Cinema on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. But especially look for us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Chill Lover Radio, and iHeartRadio as well. You can also find us on YouTube and check us out on Podchaser and on Patreon. Like, I'm not really sure how many people have enough money to give a podcast right now, but yeah. if you can spare anything, ladies and gentlemen, definitely check us out on Patreon. Uh, Honestly, th- we're, we're doing, we're, we're trying to do the world a service, and we know that you're all bored in quarantine, and we're trying to provide content for you. Yeah. Exactly. To, to brighten your day. We're doing, like I said, we're, we're essential, okay? We are essential workers, so we demand our hazard pay. <laughs> 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 well, anyway, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here. Here. I'm Bo Maddox. I'm Robert Ortegon. I'm Ashley Chancellor. Say that. Say that louder, Ash. Come on now. With conviction. I'm Ashley Chancellor. There, you there go. we go. And this was Collateral Cinema. Have a good night or day or whatever time of day it is, ladies and gentlemen. And stay and safe. Happy Wash your hands. Month. What? Happy 420 month. Happy 420 month, exactly. Oh. Yeah, we, we might as well go ahead and announce we're going to be doing Cheech and Chong's Up in Smoke. So look for that. <laughs> All <laughs> late. Yeah, once again, I'm Bo Maddox. Robert Ortegon. Ashley Chancellor. And we are out of here, finally. Oh. Laters, everybody. Later.
Collateral Cinema is an L Company production. All music and movie clips are owned by the respective creators and are used for educational purposes only. Please don't sue us. We're poor.